Uh, how are you reading the politics uh, regarding the White House and vaping today? So we've been anticipating um, headlines out of the White House on nicotine vape specifically. That was very well telegraphed over the coming weeks from the FDA and then the, the Trump administration commenting uh, last week that there would be um, new news. Um, I think the, the market is braced for that. I think it's largely been telegraphed by the nicotine vapor exposed companies like Altria, Green Lane Holdings, Turning Point Brands, Imperial Tobacco and British American Tobacco. Uh, the CDC news last week was sort of framed as a breakthrough on illnesses. Do you think it's that important? I think it's certainly helpful. There was clearly um, a lot of confusion and concern um, amongst consumers with over 2,000 um, illnesses now having been reported and, and close to 50 deaths uh, really since the first one um, in uh, late August from, from Illinois. And I think really the confusion for consumers was that there wasn't consensus between the CDC and the FDA. Was it nicotine, legal nicotine, illicit nicotine, was it legal THC, illicit THC? And it seems increasingly that the consensus view is narrowing in on um, vitamin E acetate, um, which would most commonly be found in illicit THC vapor products. Vivian, the fact that so many of these cannabis stocks have been just hammered this year, um, what areas are you most constructive on or what stocks are you most constructive on right now and why? Sure. So the, the drivers of the weakness, in particular in the Canadian marketplace, were a function of um, the market developing more slowly than um, anticipated. But that is why we're constructive on 2020. There are just not enough brick and mortar dispensaries to displace the illicit market in Canada. But increasingly, you're seeing provinces issue new licenses and relax some of the, the caps on the, the um, allowable number of dispensaries. Um, so for the Canadian LPs, Sundial uh, is our top pick. They're a little bit newer um, to the adult use marketplace, having um, just generated revenue for the first time in um, the calendar second quarter. Uh, but they are uh, premium positioned, and there's a lot of white space in the market there. For the U.S. operators, Green Thumb Industries is our favorite idea. It's an Illinois-based, um, vertically integrated, multi-state operator um, in Illinois is going to be uh, transitioning to adult use January 1st of 2020. When it comes to vaping, Viv, uh, wh where do you see opportunity right now regarding Philip Morris uh, and their jewel steak? Uh, I just wonder whether or not we're going to see any of these widespread uh, bans of products in the coming months. So when Altria um, reported earnings, they did um, write down uh, the Juul investment, um, not per perhaps the magnitude that we've seen reported in the press from other um, of the private um, investors in Juul. Um, but that's something that we're going to have to obviously monitor. I think, you know, the hope if you're Altria is that international becomes the offset, that they did temper some of their language around that because there are international jurisdictions that are proactively um, banning vaping. For Altria, you know, they'll just lean on on um, their ICOS heat not burn platform, which did get FDA approval through a pre-market tobacco authorization process and launched that in Atlanta in September. In terms of the crackdown on counterfeit pods, be it THC or be it for, for nicotine, how would you expect that to play out and what is that going to mean for the companies that are doing things above board right now? So, I mean, from an enforcement standpoint, that's, you know, really tricky um, because that really does fall under the um, FDA's purview, at least as it relates um, to nicotine. It's going to have to be more store sweeps. We've actually seen the FDA stick, uh, step up some of that enforcement activity in 2019 as they endeavored to crack down on underage um, use sales of nicotine. So more of that. On the THC side of the market, I mean, it comes down to state level enforcement, unfortunately. Um, and, you know, that's a matter of resources. Viv, have you been surprised by uh, the reaction among uh, markets where there seemed to be real long-term promise in India and China, the areas where Jewel thought the, they, were, they were really going to make their money? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, they were in China. Jewel was in China for about a week um, before the Chinese regulators um, had the, the product removed from the marketplace. You know, China's been a very tough market to crack for the global tobacco companies because it's a, it's a government-controlled um, marketplace. That, that is the ultimate opportunity. Um, but, you know, I think a lot of people are looking at the experience that we've seen in the U.S., both in terms of some of the illnesses as well as separately um, the youth vaping, and it is driving a point of caution um, in international jurisdictions.
Uh, we're welcoming back Meg Terrell, who uh, spoke to us just a moment ago. Meg, I don't know if you want to ask Viv a question or uh, respond to something we've already talked about. I'd love to ask a question about something we talked about with Dr. Scott Gottlieb this morning, who um, said he thought that potentially Juul should just come off the market completely. And of course, they've already taken off the mint flavored pods they announced last week, which were 70% of their sales. All of this, though, even if there was a broad ban, would potentially be, you know, until next May when it's due for the companies to apply for approval to get their products on the market. They all have to do that by then. Do you think that these companies can prove there's a net public health benefit to e-cigarettes to the FDA so that they can t continue selling these products? Um, certainly, there's been a lot of um, rigorous R&D um, that's gone into the understanding um, the composition of the vapor aerosol and the chemical constituents um, within it. Um, so I think, you know, it's really up to the FDA to help offer a framework around what kind of science it is that they're looking for specifically. And then, you know, for us on the investing side, we need a better understanding of how the FDA is really going to weigh kind of the, the true health risks and or benefits in terms of kind of, you know, the, the the chemical properties of the product unbalanced with um, youth vapor because that is the FDA's primary charge is they want to protect youth from entering the nicotine category. There is some Finally, speculation. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, Meg. Thanks, Carl. I was just going to ask, you know, there's been some speculation in the analyst community that the crackdown on vaping could lead some uh, former combustible cigarette users to return to smoking cigarettes. Have you seen any evidence of that yet? We have not. We've only gotten one month of uh, Nielsen data, and the improvement sequentially in the cigarette volumes was de minimis, um, despite the fact that month over month revenues for the e-cigarette category fell 18 percent. As we think about the outlook that's been offered by some of the larger global tobacco companies for the U.S. market specifically, Imperial Tobacco reported earnings last week. They're looking for a 5 to 6 percent decline, despite a more cautious view on vapor. So they are not looking for cigarette smokers to return to the cigarette category. Uh uh, that was my exact question, Viv, because uh, I know you look at these weekly sales, but you don't believe that the fact that e-cigarettes are on the margin harder to get now is going to mean a broad return to combustible. Well, Carl, not all um, e-cigarette smokers uh, or vapors actually smoke. Um, per Altria's data, it's about 50-50. So um, even for vapors who used to be smokers, um, they've transitioned away from cigarettes exclusively. So it's harder to make the argument that all those vapors are going to come back because they're not all smokers.